because the news never stops. I welcome you back to the Northern Miner Podcast. My name is Adrian Bocabelli. We have the inflation report just came out under expectation. U.S. consumer prices rose less than expected in November, up 7.1% from a year ago. Still 7% inflation. And I got to say, in the crypto world there, Binance is attracting some FUD, as they call it in the industry, fear, uncertainty, and doubt. So that is also pretty interesting. Uh, Turning to our newspaper here, we also have a few things going on. We have the nominations open for the 2023 Peter Monk and Ira Thomas Awards. And of course, Peter Monk was the founder of Barrick, now passed on, as many of you know. And Ira Thomas is the president and CEO of Lucera Diamond. And let me just read you the details here because, you know, this industry is always talking about how we need more younger people in it. And so this is a way you can at least encourage uh, younger people. This is by Blair McBride for the Northern Miner. Young Mining Professionals YMP in partnership with the Northern Miner has opened nominations for the 2023 Young Mining Professional of the Year Awards. The organization said in a release on Thursday, the awards are named after two iconic entrepreneurs in the mining industry, Peter Monk and Ira Thomas. YMP is soliciting nominations from the public to identify the top leaders in the mining and metals industry. The YMP Awards recognizes two young mining entrepreneurs, a male and a female who over the past year and during the course of their careers have demonstrated exceptional leadership skills and an innovative thinking to create value for their companies and shareholders as well as for themselves. To be considered, nominees must be under the age of 40 as of December 31st, 2022, and currently engaged in the mining and metals industry. Nominations can be submitted online at youngminingprofessionals.com slash awards. So the Northern Miner is very proud to be involved with this wonderful, what's becoming an institution here, and they are global. Like, from my understanding, there are chapters in London. I believe there's chapters in Australia. It's quite impressive. Uh, Stephen Stewart from the Ore Group, who actually I just saw at the Canadian Mining Symposium, he plays a major role in the Young Mining Professional Awards. So it's just a nice way you can do your part to encourage those who are performing exceptionally and who are younger, you know, which maybe takes a bit more courage these days to go in this industry, to be perfectly frank, although they probably are remunerated quite well. And also, for those that weren't able to attend the Canadian Mining Symposium, that video of the event is going to premiere on Friday. Let me just look at the date here. On December 16th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, you can watch the whole thing, and you just have to register. Just go to northernminer.com. I look for the Northern Miners Flagship Mining and Investment event premieres online for that story. And simply click on register here. In the second paragraph, there's a link there. And you can watch interviews with Sean Boyd, Ira Thomas, Phil Baker from Hecla, and Nadine Miller on cybersecurity, as well as several presentations from many up-and-coming mining companies in the space. It was an awesome event. So we do encourage you to check that out. Again, just go to northernminer.com and look for the Northern Miners flagship mining and investment event premieres online. And finally, just looking at the website here, Northern Miner Editor-in-Chief Alicia Hyatt has a site visit for a very exciting place right now. G2 Goldfields hopes to add to Discovery Count at Oco Project in Guyana. And I believe it was Guyana where Exxon made a huge discovery offshore that a lot of the energy people are talking about. Let me just double check that right now. Guyana oil, Exxon, it is. And, you know, what I was hearing there is that basically there is a very small population, maybe a million people, and that this discovery is basically going to completely transform Guyana because there are not that many people and the riches are enormous in the sense that it could actually change the structure of the oil market. So Guyana is getting interesting. They are getting the message on resources. So check that out. There's a site visit just to kind of round out your understanding of a really up and coming place that you don't really traditionally talk about too much. So coming up this program, we have what I think is becoming a quarterly event here around the world in 60 minutes because we have Paul from the Sirius Report on next week. So I thought we could set the table by looking at some of the many stories that are flying under the radar here. Like, did you know there's a pipeline agreement that was made between Spain and France? 
you know, if you're digging deep into the FT, you'll have found that story, but I'm not seeing that anywhere. To me, this is front page news. I don't know about you, but for me, this is uh, front page news if Spain and France agree on a pipeline. I mean, what is one of the major stories of this year? It's energy, particularly in Europe. So you think we would all know about it and frankly be talking about that. I have not seen a single thing, and maybe that's because I'm off visiting relatives or something, but a lot of things are flying under the radar here. So it's always fascinating to see what you find when you start plugging in these terms like pipeline into Google News. I mean, and remember the gold purchases that had doubled last quarter and they were record and everybody was kind of wondering who the mystery buyer is? Well, we know it's China. That came out on Bloomberg via mining.com here. And again, this is you know, for me, this is kind of front page material, but it is flying under the radar. So we have a ton of stories like that, that we're going to go through. It's interesting, like the news is reported, but it doesn't always make the front page. So we're digging a little deeper here in preparation for our wonderful upcoming interview with Paul from the Sirius Report as a way of setting the table. So you have a banquet in store for you, my friends, once again, for what might be a quarterly event here around the world in 60 minutes. So with that, if you want to find us online, you can find us at northernminer.com. You can find us on Twitter at Northern Miner and on Instagram at The Northern Miner and on Facebook, LinkedIn, and YouTube, where we also host these podcasts and wherever podcasts are available, including Spotify, Stitcher, Apple Podcasts, and SoundCloud. And with that, let's turn to the news. And just before we go into the news, I'm going to change the order a bit because the news is the feature content as we go around the world this week. And so let's take a quick look at metal prices first. And before we do that, let's just take a look at the U.S. 10-year bond, which we always like to look at for context, and is down again at 3.452%. That is down 0.1% from last week. So the U.S. 10-year bond continues its decline in yield, which I think will make a lot of people at the central banks probably happy, one would think. Turning to our metal prices, we'd like to thank our friends at mining.com slash markets for providing us with these prices each and every week. And on December 13th, gold is trained at $1,819.43 per ounce. That is $43 higher than last week. Silver is above $24 at $24.09 per ounce. That is $1.77 higher than last week. Platinum is trained at $1,045.75 per ounce. That is $44 higher than last week. And palladium is at $1,964.34 per ounce. That is $99 higher than last week. Turning to our industrial metals, copper is also higher at $3.85 per pound. That is $0.07 cents higher than last week. Aluminum is unchanged at $1.11 per pound. Lead is $0.02 cents higher at a dollar per pound. Nickel is also higher at $13.54 per pound. That is a dollar and 23 cents higher than last week. Tin is also higher at $11.20 per pound. That is 54 cents higher than last week. And cobalt is unchanged at $23.25 per pound. And zinc is at $1.47 per pound. That is 8 cents higher than last week. Zooming out, it looks like things are going quite well. In the metals markets, I'd say precious metals look quite strong. I mean, silver above $24, gold above $1,800, palladium up almost $100. So precious metals doing well and industrial metals look quite healthy themselves. I mean, apart from aluminum, which is unchanged, almost all of the industrial metals are higher. I mean, nickel is back at $13.54. Copper is approaching $4 at $3.85. So definitely the wind in the sails of metals right now. And those are your metal prices. And turning to the website, Bloomberg News via mining.com, a story that I was just alluding to, China reveals gold buying after quarter of mystery purchases. And it says here, China reported an increase in its gold reserves for the first time in more than three years, shedding some light on the identity of the mystery buyers in the bullion market. The People's Bank of China raised its holding by 32 tons in November from the month before, according to data on its website on Wednesday. That brought its total to 1,980 tons, the sixth biggest central bank bullion hoard in the world. 
you know, anecdotally, I've heard analysts say it's like, you know, something like 20 times this or 10 times this. The gold industry has been rife with speculation over the central banks behind nearly 400 tons of sovereign purchases during the third quarter. Only about a quarter of the buying was publicly reported at the time, causing market watchers to tout both China and Russia as potential culprits. For China, the need to find an alternative to dollars, which dominates its reserves, has rarely been greater. Tensions with the U.S. has been high since measures taken against its semiconductor firms, while Russia's invasion of Ukraine has demonstrated Washington's willingness to sanction central bank reserves. The PBOC's purchases may be part of a plan to diversify its reserves away from the dollar, said Giovanni Staunovo, an analyst at UBS Group AG. Quote, gold holdings in China as part of the total reserves are still very low, so there's probably room for further purchases down the road. So there you go. It is China. Speaking of gold, this is also Bloomberg via mining.com. And remember the spoofing trial. Ex-JP Morgan gold trader found guilty in spoofing trial. And former JP Morgan Chase company gold and silver trader Christopher Jordan was convicted of wire fraud affecting a financial institution by a federal jury in Chicago. The latest win for U.S. prosecutors in their crackdown on illegal spoofing trades and market manipulation. Jordan was found guilty Friday after a four-day trial in the same courthouse where two of his more senior colleagues on the J.P. Morgan Precious Metals desk were convicted in August on spoofing-related charges for deceptive buy and sell orders. Jordan worked at the bank from 2006 to late 2009. Wow, that is all, you know, 15 years later, they come with a charge. While his deceptive trades occurred before spoofing was made a crime in 2010, he used the same technique by placing large orders he never intended to execute and quickly canceled so he could make trades on the other side of the market, prosecutors said. It was part of a, quote, scheme to rig gold and silver markets in his favor, end quote, Assistant U.S. Attorney Lisa Beth Jennings said in her closing statement, quote, the spoof orders the defendant placed tricked other traders, end quote, and were intended to deceive the market about supply and demand. And the defense lawyer, James Benjamin, said, quote, we are sorely disappointed by today's verdict. Chris Jordan is a good and honorable man who did his job in good faith. Jordan's sentencing was tentatively scheduled for May 2023. There's a lot of waiting around once you get involved in the court system, isn't there? So more evidence of tampering in the precious metals market. I mean, I brought this up with Jeffrey Christian, and from his perspective of CPM Group, and from his perspective, it was kind of much ado about nothing. And, you know, as far as the gold bugs are concerned, or the more conspiracy-oriented, this is the smoking gun. So it's interesting to just see how even when you get a resolution where, okay, someone was tampering, that the interpretations then are quite different. Continuing on, J.P. Morgan Chase, so Jamie Dimon, the CEO, warns oil gas issues will persist for years because of Russia-Ukraine war. So we have a few stories on pipelines here that I wanted to tackle. So let's just see what J.P. Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon said. He was on CBS's Face the Nation, and he said, quote, the danger of this war, referring to the Ukraine-Russia war, is extraordinary saying the public has a false sense of security. Pretty interesting. Continuing on, quote, and it can go on for years, but this oil and gas thing, it looks like the Europeans will get through it this winter, but this oil and gas problem is going to go on for years. So if I was in the government or anywhere else, I'd say I have to prepare for getting much worse. I hope it doesn't, but I would definitely be preparing for it to get much worse. And this is also interesting. So he also said that because we've had kind of a decline in oil recently, he said that it was part because of the economic slowdown in China with the zero COVID strategy and the start of a recession in Europe. But the banking executive warned that those short-term declines won't last forever, calling for a Marshall Plan for Energy that includes significant investment in energy infrastructure to boost production and keep prices low. This is The Hill via Yahoo News. And he continued telling Margaret Brennan, quote, those things will reverse and this underinvestment in oil and gas, it will hurt you two or three years out. It's quite predictable, but it's not today. And finally, he said, we need secure, reliable, cheap oil and gas. The problem, you know, a lot of people think that oil and gas being priced high is good for CO2. It's not. End quote. So another interesting take, because a lot of people think the less oil and gas used, the better as far as CO2 is concerned. But to make the transition, we probably need cheap oil is what he's referring to here. Continuing on, a story 
from Reuters via mining.com. And let's see what it says here. European Commission weighs sanctions on Russia's mining industry. So first we saw the LME consider blocking Russian metal. Now it's the EU who actually just put their price cap on Russian oil. Now it's on Russian mining. Let's take a closer look. The European Commission is considering a ban on new investments in Russia's mining sector as part of a fresh set of sanctions aimed at eroding the Kremlin's ability to fund its war against Ukraine, the Financial Times reported on Tuesday. So this is Reuters via mining.com reporting on a story from the Financial Times. The ban would be part of a ninth European Union sanctions package that officials are planning to discuss with member states in the coming days, the newspaper reported, citing people with knowledge of the discussions. Officials hope to have the ban, which will exempt some specific products, agreed by the end of next week, it said. And the FT said the new sanctions package could also include export controls on civilian technologies that Brussels believes Russia has used to support its arms factories, a ban on transactions with three or more Russian banks, and targeted sanctions against another 180 individuals. Continuing on the energy topic, mysterious dirt cheap oil is being marketed to Houston traders, and this is BNN Bloomberg. The offer seemed too good to be true, up to 200,000 barrels of heavy sour crude at a $30 discount to the U.S. benchmark. The sales pitch came from Jonathan Plemmel of little-known trading house Sidewalks Holdings. Plemmel had documents saying the crude was from Mexico, said he'd even visited a lab of Quetzalcoatlcos for quality tests, but the prospective buyers he approached were wary. I couldn't say for certain where the oil was coming from, Plemmel told Bloomberg. Ultimately, the traders interviewed by Bloomberg said they passed on the dirt cheap barrels of oil, concerned about where it came from. But with Russia's invasion of Ukraine upending trade flows and fueling massive oil price swings, the appetite for cheap crude remains high. We have a quote from Alejandra Leon, a director of Latin America Upstream at S&P Global, quote, It wouldn't be surprising to find that some of the oil of questionable origin had already entered the U.S., U.S. has very tight controls, but small volumes, crossing the border by truck, and a lot more difficult to control. Elsewhere, the black market for oil is booming with sanctions on Russia, Iran, and Venezuela creating opportunities for some buyers to lock in bargain basement deals. The three countries together may be exporting more than 4 million barrels a day of discounted oil, according to EIA and Bloomberg data. Stolen oil, meanwhile, makes up 5-7% to of the global market, totaling $133 billion dollars according to international think tank United Nations University. So, also interesting. So here's that pipeline story I was telling you about. Spain and France say planned undersea pipeline will cost $2.5 billion. You know, these days, that sounds pretty reasonable for a underwater pipeline. $2.5 billion. I mean, you wonder what took so long. Countries abandon idea of first piping natural gas through Link and say it will carry only hydrogen. Oh, now this is interesting. So they abandon the idea of first piping the natural gas through the pipeline and say it will only carry hydrogen. Interesting. Spain and France have put a $2.5 billion price tag on a new undersea pipeline between the countries, which will carry only hydrogen and no longer natural gas as originally planned. How bizarre is that? Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez provided the estimated cost for the project and said the pipeline would be operational by 2030 on Friday, speaking at an Alicante summit where he unveiled details with French President Emmanuel Macron and Portugal's Prime Minister Antonio Costa. European Commission President Ursula von der Leyen, who was also present at the summit of European countries that border the Mediterranean Sea, gave her support for the pipeline. A key signal is the countries seek maximum possible EU funding for it. It seems like the EU Commission just has more and more power. The hydrogen pipeline, which will run from Barcelona to Marseille, is likely to be one of Europe's biggest and most expensive infrastructure projects, in response to an energy crisis caused by huge cuts in Russian energy exports. The EU has prioritized hydrogen as an alternative energy source as it aims to reduce greenhouse gas emissions to at least 55% below 1990 levels by 2030. So they are really speeding up this reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. The decision to build hydrogen-only infrastructure marks a change from only October, when France and Spain unveiled the idea and said it would first ship natural gas before carrying hydrogen once green technologies related to the gas had matured. The shift can make it easier to access EU funding, which is strictly limited for fossil fuel infrastructure. Quote, the rules for applying for European funding require that it's only a hydrogen pipeline. So that's the expectation at the moment, said one Spanish government official. The three countries will apply for EU funds for what are known as projects of common interest, which can cover up to 50% of qualifying initiatives. 
The application deadline is December 15th, with a decision expected early next year. And this is also interesting. Just one last paragraph here. However, given the exclusion of natural gas and the time it will take to build, the undersea pipeline will not ease Europe's current energy problems. Quote, this is not a piece of infrastructure that is meant to solve the current crisis. It is about the ecological transition in the future, said the Spanish official. So isn't that interesting? I mean, this whole idea was probably brought about by the energy crisis. And now, halfway through, it's just about an ecological transition. And then continuing just some more doubts here, but there are doubts about the scale of long-term demand for green hydrogen, which Spain and Portugal plan to produce from water using energy from renewable sources, and the wisdom of transporting it over long distances as opposed to making it close to where it is needed. And finally, we have a quote here from Anna Maria Yaller Makarovitz, an analyst at the Institute for Energy Economics and Financial Analysis, quote, Significant uncertainties have emerged about the project's purpose, demand, technology, cost, financing, and overall need. Well, yeah, so it continues here. And continuing on, this is from Al Jazeera. Greece and Bulgaria discuss oil pipeline bypassing Bosphorus Strait. An EU embargo on Russian oil and a transit fee hike to use the Bosphorus Strait are reviving a shelved pipeline plan. Now Greece and Bulgaria are discussing an oil pipeline. And this is by John Serapolos, a European Union embargo on Russian oil that takes effect on Monday, this was written last week, has led Greece and Bulgaria to talk about reviving a long-defunct oil pipeline project that bypasses the Bosphorus Strait. Now, I believe that's Turkey who runs the Bosphorus Strait. The pipeline would run 280 kilometers from the port of Alexandropolis, on the Aegean Sea to the port of Burgas on the Black Sea and might continue as far north as the port of Costanza in Romania, Bulgaria's energy minister Roman Ristov told Al Jazeera. And we have a quote, we have a two-year derogation from EU sanctions to buy Russian oil, but after that we will face problems because of the height and transit fees through the Bosphorus, Ristov said in an answer to a question from Al Jazeera at an energy conference in Athens. And the Greek energy minister Kostas Skrekas said in a statement, quote, we support the project, and neither minister agreed to further questions. Continuing on, key Canada U.S. oil pipeline outage could lead to crude supply shortage in the States, according to experts, and this is Reuters via Global News. An outage of the largest oil pipeline to the United States from Canada could affect inventories at a key U.S. storage hub and cut crude supplies to two oil refining centers, analysts and traders said on Friday. So this just came out on December 9th, so just a few days ago here. TC's Energy Keystone Pipeline ferries about 600,000 barrels of Canadian crude per day to the United States. It was shut late Wednesday after a breach spewed more than 14,000 barrels of oil into a Kansas creek, making it the largest crude spill in the United States in nearly a decade. While TC Energy has yet to say when it could restart the pipeline, a previous Keystone spill affected operations for two weeks. And we have a quote from Michael Tran, Managing Director at RBC Capital Markets, quote, the main question continues to be the duration of the potential outage. The longer the duration ultimately, of course, means potentially tighter inventories in Cushing or heavy crude on the Gulf Coast. Continuing on to the BRICS here, and we have a story from the cradle.co, which actually has a pretty nice website. I've never seen them before, so I'm not really sure where they're coming from, but you kind of get a hint from the headline here. Goodbye G20, hello BRICS Plus. And this is by Pepe Escobar. The increasingly irrelevant G20 summit concluded with sure signs that BRICS Plus will be the way forward for Global South cooperation. And this kind of feeds into our larger theme of this distrust of the West and the G20 and the G7. So we don't necessarily need to agree with all this, but let's see what they're saying here. The redeeming quality of a tense G20 held in Bali otherwise managed by laudable Indonesian graciousness, was to sharply define which way the geopolitical winds are blowing. That was encapsulated in the summit's two highlights, the much-anticipated China-U.S. presidential meeting, representing the most important bilateral relationship of the 21st century and the final G20 statement. The three-hour, 30-minute-long face-to-face meeting between Chinese President Xi Jinping and his U.S. counterpart Joe Biden, requested by the White House, took place at the Chinese delegation's residence in Bali, and not at the G20 venue at the luxury Aperva Kepinski in Nuzadua. Now, I've heard, I think it was on Lay's Real Talk, this YouTube channel, I've heard there is a protocol that 
the leader that's been in power longer is the person who is visited. In other words, if there's a meeting at somewhere like the G20, and if Xi Jinping has been in office longer than, say, Joe Biden, then the protocol is for Joe Biden to go over to Xi Jinping's place. So that is anecdotal, but that may explain it and not just be a sign of desperation. Although, who knows? The Chinese Ministry of Foreign Affairs concisely outlined what really mattered. Specifically, Xi told Biden that Taiwan independence is simply out of the question. Xi also expressed hope that NATO, the EU, and the US will engage in comprehensive dialogue with Russia. Instead of confrontation, the Chinese president chose to highlight the layers of common interest and cooperation. So pretty positive towards China here. Biden, according to the Chinese, made several points. U.S. does not seek a new Cold War, does not support Taiwan independence, does not support two Chinas or one China, one Taiwan, does not seek decoupling from China, and does not want to contain Beijing. Well, I mean, that's a little hard to believe. I mean, it seems like the semiconductor move is all about containing Beijing, isn't it? So this is back to this idea that, you know, that you often hear of the Chinese saying that the Americans speak out of both sides of their mouth. So we're not trying to do any of the things. We don't want Taiwan independence. So the final G20 statement was an even fuzzier matter, the result of arduous compromise. And this is another theme we're seeing of this, it getting harder and harder for the West to stay in agreement here. As much as the G20 is self-described as, quote, the premier forum for global economic cooperation engaged to address the world's major economic challenges, the G7 inside the G20 in Bali had the summit de facto hijacked by the war. War gets almost double the number of mentions in the statement compared to food after all. So this website, The Cradle, is pretty, I would say, anti-West, so that should be kept in mind, but I think we still need to pay attention to what is being said out here. In the spirit of the charity of interpretation, trying to get to see the other side's point of view from their own perspective. Continuing on, the new candidate countries for BRICS expansion, and again, who knows where these websites are coming from. This is called Silk Road Briefing. So take it for what it is, which is just a story and not necessarily fact. But let's see what it says. If accepted, the new proposed BRICS members would create an entity with a GDP 30% larger than the United States over 50% of the global population, and in control of 60% of the global gas reserves. And it says the Russian foreign minister, Sergei Lavrov, has stated that over a dozen countries have formally applied to join the BRICS grouping following the group's decision to allow new members earlier this year. The BRICS currently include Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. It is not a free trade bloc, but members do coordinate on trade matters and have established a policy bank the new development bank to coordinate infrastructure loans that was set up in 2014 in order to provide alternative loan mechanisms from the IMF and World Bank structures, which the members had felt had become too U.S. centric. The Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank was set up by China at about the same time for largely the same reasons and to offer alternative financing than was provided by the IMF and World Banks, which are felt to impose political reform policies designed to assist the United States in return for providing loans. So more stories on the BRICS, and I think we have a couple more here. This was interesting. This is a website called CGTN. And again, these are all sourced from Google News. So if you're wondering, it doesn't mean they're true, but they have been vetted to a certain degree by Google for what that's worth. So in other words, we don't need to believe every little you know, part of these stories, but these are the stories that are being promoted as news. And that in itself has value, whether they are fact or fiction. So here's another one, an opinion piece by Abby Sheck Jibaya for CGTN, Saudi Arabia's overtures to China, BRICS, not against a third country. So this is an opinion piece, but again, just getting people's views out there, outside of our mainstream media bubble here. Saudi Arabia and the wider Arab world value their relationship with China as the region's biggest economic partner with Riyadh, even contemplating joining the BRICS group of emerging economies as the Gulf Kingdom recalibrates its global vision amid shifting geopolitics and world order, according to Saudi political analyst and media commentator Salman Al Ansari. Al Ansari, however, asserted that China's deepening ties with the Arab world, as amplified by President Xi Jinping's recent Saudi visit and high-powered summits with the Arab leaders, shouldn't be seen from the prism of a great power zero-sum game, despite the United States' shrinking strategic presence in the region and the Saudi-U.S. relations facing certain tensions. And we have a quote from Al Ansari that was taken from an interview 
via Zoom from Riyadh, quote, it is indeed a fact that the Saudi-U.S. relationship is not at its best right now, but the U.S. remains the kingdom's and the region's biggest security partner, and China is the biggest economic partner. The kingdom is not interested in becoming a pawn on the chessboard between world powers, but would remain a professional player. He said, adding that Saudi Arabia is committed to putting its own national interests above all. Quote, the current world circumstances are different and the Saudis are adjusting their global vision accordingly. Twenty years ago, China used to be the biggest trading partner of only 12 nations in the world. Today, it is the biggest trading partner of over 120 nations in the world. That is 60% of all nations. So it is indeed very important for Saudi Arabia and the Arab region to have strong relations with the Chinese nation. So this is quite interesting, and maybe some of you have heard Felix Zuloff come out, the macroeconomist. He doesn't do many interviews, but he's done several in the last couple of weeks here. And he has brought up this point as well, that, you know, 20 years ago, you know, in 2001, if you looked at who was the biggest trading partner of most countries, it was like the U.S. was by far the biggest trading partner. And now when you look at that map, it's more than half as China, as Al Ansari here says, 60%. So other interesting moves out there. Here's just a very a one I want to touch on very quickly from oilprice.com. Which countries are most influenced by China? A new index measures China's influence around the world. The China index ranks Pakistan atop a list of 82 countries. Germany is the highest ranked European country at 19th, and the United States leads North America in 21st position. And just a few more. Behind Pakistan, Southeast Asia features prominently in the rankings with Cambodia and Singapore listed in second and third, followed by Thailand. The Philippines is seventh and Malaysia is tenth. South Africa is the first African country at number five, where it is tied with Peru, the highest ranked South American country. Kyrgyzstan and Tajikistan, which border China's western Xinjiang province are the Central Asian countries most influenced by Beijing, coming at 8th and ninth place on the index. Meanwhile, Germany is the highest ranked European country, and the United States leads North America. And finally, we have a quote from Min Xuan Wu, the co-founder and CEO of DoubleThink Labs. Quote, a major goal of this database is to raise awareness around the world about the different aspects of Chinese influence and what that can actually look like. We've taken a much broader and nuanced look at what the influence can be, which can tell us more about what Beijing is actually doing and the different ways it can apply pressure. Fascinating. So it's good to know that as we look at other stories, say if we see a story between Pakistan and China, then you might have a bit more perspective after knowing they are the most influenced country in the world by China. Finally, on this Global South BRICS theme, Global South births a new game-changing payment system. And this is also from the cradle. So remember, not the most pro-Western news outlet, but nevertheless in Google News. Challenging the Western monetary system, the Eurasian Economic Union is leading the Global South towards a new common payment system to bypass the U.S. dollar by the same author from the cradle, Pepe Escobar. Well, let's just take a closer look here. The Eurasia Economic Union is speeding up its design of a common payment system which has been closely discussed for nearly a year with the Chinese under the stewardship of Sergei Glazyev, the EAEU's minister in charge of integration and macroeconomy. Through its regulatory body, the Eurasian Economic Commission, the EAEU, has just extended a very serious proposal to the BRICS nations, which crucially are already on the way to turning into BRICS Plus, a sort of G20 of the Global South. The system will include a single payment card, in direct competition with Visa and MasterCard, merging the already existing Russian Mir, China's Union Pay, India's RuPay, Brazil's ELO, and others. So this seems like a competition to SWIFT that will represent a direct challenge to the Western-designed and enforced monetary system head-on. And it comes on the heels of BRICS members already transacting their bilateral trade in local currencies and bypassing the U.S. dollar. So more movement here. Now, turning to metals here, WTO, the World Trade Organization, says Trump's metal tariffs broke rules as U.S. rejects findings. And this is Bloomberg News via mining.com. Now, we have been discussing this whole concept of expediency, how the U.S. seems to be moving more and more towards doing what's convenient for the U.S. over international law, while simultaneously maintaining that they are in favor of a rules-based order 
And again, we see parallels to this in the Peloponnesian War. It was the Melian Dialogue, if I remember correctly, where this idea of, you know, you say it's all about rules and about, let's say, democracy, but really at the end of the day, at least in the Peloponnesian War, it's the rule of the strongest. And, you know, as the Athenians themselves said to the Melians, if I remember that correctly. We will dig that up, actually, because we've mentioned this a couple of times here, so we don't want to just say random things. Uh, we want to be accurate here and actually walk away with something. So anyways, let's take a look here. Again, Bloomberg News via mining.com. The U.S. violated international trade rules when it imposed steel and aluminum tariffs under former President Donald Trump. The World Trade Organization said a decision Washington rejected and stated won't lead to removal of duties. The 25% tariffs on global steel imports and 10% import taxes on global aluminum, which Trump imposed on national security grounds, violated basic WTO rules, a dispute settlement panel said in a series of rulings published Friday. The WTO panel said U.S. national security claims, quote, are not justified, end quote, because they were not, quote, taken in time of war or other emergency in international relations. The U.S. strongly rejected the flawed interpretation and conclusions in the report and will not remove its duties as a result of the rulings, Adam Hodge, a spokesman for the U.S. Trade Representative, said in a statement. So, interesting. Now, we have another story from Bloomberg here, which kind of is basically the same story, but I guess by a different writer, but adds some color also to this story. Such a ruling which is yet to be confirmed by the WTO, would undermine one of Trump's most controversial trade decisions. It could also increase pressure on President Joe Biden to reconsider a series of internationally unpopular tariffs aimed at protecting U.S. manufacturing jobs and swing state voting districts. The Norwegian government sent out an email announcing the decision, but a spokesman declined to comment further because the report hasn't been published by the WTO. Such a ruling is unlikely to impact American metal producers because the U.S. can effectively veto it by lodging an appeal at any point in the next 60 days. WTO appeals cannot currently be heard because the Trump administration paralyzed the appellate body in 2019. So, on and on it goes. And further, not only are they not dialing them back, we have a story from Reuters, U.S. floats new steel aluminum tariffs based on carbon emissions. So if anything, they're going to amp them up. This is December 7th. U.S. officials are proposing to levy tariffs on steel and aluminum based on how much carbon the producing country's industries emit in a bid to fight climate change and, quote, dirty metals made in China and elsewhere, two people familiar with the plan said on Wednesday. The proposal from the U.S. Trade Representative's office to be negotiated with the European Union would create a global club of market-oriented countries seeking to reduce carbon emissions. The plan would set emissions intensity standards for the production of specific steel and aluminum and products according to a document describing the plan seen by Reuters. Countries that are members of the global arrangement with emissions exceeding these standards would pay higher tariffs when exporting metals to countries with lower emissions, according to the document. Countries with steel and aluminum plant emissions at or below those of the importing country would pay no carbon-based tariffs. Quote, there would be an advantage of being in the club as it would provide a lower level of carbon tariffs while countries outside the club would pay higher tariffs. One of the sources said, adding the proposal aimed to incentivize investments to reduce emissions. This is all very conceptual and there's a lot of work ahead of this. The details are going to be very important. So it looks like they're actually looking to add to their tariffs rather than dial back. And a story that reacts to this from Bloomberg News via mining.com, U.S. risks stoking inflation if carbon-linked tariffs hit China. China's steel and aluminum exports are under attack once again as the U.S. and European Union weigh new tariffs linked to carbon emissions. The idea from President Joe Biden's administration would probably have the biggest impact on the aluminum market, particularly in the EU, which has relied on Chinese smelters to plug gaps in output following Russia's invasion of Ukraine. That dependency highlights the inflationary risks of any measures that would shrink supply or add costs based on climate goals. And we have a quote from Paul Gambles, MBMG Group co-founder and managing partner, who told Bloomberg TV, This is Biden potentially stoking inflation, damaging global trade, and certainly not helping Sino-U.S. relations. It's a triple whammy. The EU is already considering a carbon tax on imports, including steel and aluminum, and China is the biggest producer of both metals. 
It exports its surplus, at times drawing accusations that Beijing is swamping the world market to the detriment of other suppliers. It's also the world's worst polluter. The steel industry is China's second biggest emitter after electricity generation, and combined with aluminum, accounts for about one-fifth of the nation's carbon. So it's steel and aluminum are major emitters. And we have a story from the Northern Miner here. Canada's critical mineral strategy focuses on faster timelines and building remote infrastructure. It's by Blair McBride. The federal government on Friday unveiled the details of its critical mineral strategy, a plan first introduced in its April budget that earmarks almost $3.8 billion over eight years to further develop Canada's place in the global critical minerals industry. A significant portion of the total funding, $1.5 billion, is allocated over seven years for constructing infrastructure for critical minerals projects in remote areas, such as the Ring of Fire in northern Ontario, and $40 million is set aside to support northern regulatory processes in reviewing and permitting projects. Officially announced in Vancouver by Natural Resource Minister Jonathan Wilkinson, the 52-page document outlines the government's plan for Canada, quote, to become a global supplier of choice for critical minerals, end quote, and the digital technologies they enable. Quote, there is no energy transition without critical minerals. The sun provides the raw energy, but electricity flows through copper, nuclear power requires uranium, and electric vehicles require batteries made with lithium and cobalt. And a couple of headlines here. Valet to break out base metals unit sells stake in 2023. That is Bloomberg News via mining.com. After several years of deliberations, iron ore giant Valet SA is finally laying out a path for unlocking value from its nickel and copper business. As demand for the so-called battery metals pick up, so they are looking to separate their nickel and copper from their iron ore business, which is quite interesting. Another headline, Turquoise Hill shareholders approve Rio Tinto's $3.3 billion buyout bid. That is Reuters via mining.com. So this deal has finally gone through, and Turquoise Hill said 86% voted to approve Rio Tinto, acquiring 49% of shares that it does not already own, giving the Anglo-Australian miner a 66% stake in Oyu Tolgoi, the world's largest known copper and gold deposit. And another headline, Trafigura posts record $7 billion profit in blowout year. So the commodities traders are making bank this year with a $7 billion profit. That is Bloomberg News via mining.com. Continuing on, a large deposit of rare earth minerals has been discovered in Maine. This has a paywall. That is from the pressherald.com. So I believe a local newspaper in Maine. So pretty interesting over there. And moving on, Columbia to create national mining company, 2022 royalties soar. So this is Reuters via mining.com. Let's get a little bit more detail here. Columbia is preparing to launch a national mining company. The president of the government's National Mining Association said on Wednesday, adding that the coal mining royalties during the year had more than doubled. The government of President Gustavo Pedro had pledged to reform the mining sector, ruling out more licenses for large-scale open-pit coal mines, as it focuses on minerals that are important for the energy transition, such as copper. Part of that effort will include launching a new state-owned mining company, starting with an agreement to bring two international gold trading companies under control of the government, a and President Alvaro Pardo told journalists during a press conference in Colombia. So, interesting, the government wants a bigger role in Colombia, so heads up to all the miners in Colombia there. Reuters has a headline here, India scraps export tax on low-grade iron ore, some steel intermediates. So this is interesting. So they actually got rid of a tax on iron ore exports that are low grade. Let's take a closer look. India scrapped export taxes on low grade iron ore and some intermediate steel products beginning Saturday. This is in November 19th. After months of complaints from miners and steelmakers about loss of foreign sales opportunities, the move set out in a notification issued late on Friday reverses the imposition in May of a 50% tax on exports of iron ore lumps and fines with less than 58% iron ore contact. The tax now returns to 30% from 50%. Wow. So those are pretty serious taxes. Continuing on. Now this is to the LME. And remember how Alcoa... They were supposedly very concerned about Russian metals flooding the LME. I mean, my take was, wouldn't that be great if prices of commodities went down? So here we have a story from Reuters. No surge of Russian metal into LME warehouse exchange. So it never happened. LME approved warehouses have not seen a surge of Russian metal. This is November 14th, by the way. After unfounded worries that the bulk of consumers would shun the metal. 
The exchange released new data showing that there was no major change in the amounts of Russian metal in LME warehouses last month, supporting its decision announced late on Friday not to ban Russian metal from its system. Some producers and other market participants had been vocal in calling for bans of Russian metal, saying because many consumers were refusing to buy the material, it would flood into LME storage facilities. So it never happened. And we have a story here that LME is drawing takeover interest from rivals after the nickel crisis. This is Bloomberg via mining.com. The London Metal Exchange has attracted takeover interest from rivals as the historic institution wrestles with its future in the wake of March's nickel crisis. Intercontinental Exchange made an approach to buy the LME earlier this year from owner Hong Kong Exchanges and Clearing, according to people familiar with the matter. While ICE was rebuffed, it may try again in the future, said the people, who asked not to be identified discussing private information. CME Group doesn't believe the LME is for sale and is focusing on its own metals business, but it may be interested in bidding for the LME in the future, said people familiar with its thinking. So this is all a result of the nickel fallout from the sounds of it. And here we have another story, this time by Pratima Desai from Reuters. Analysis, turbulence still haunts LME nickel months on from trade debacle. With memories still fresh of the nickel market meltdown in March, the industry didn't need a reminder about just how dysfunctional the LME nickel contract has become, but last month it got one anyway. Months after turbulence highlighted shortcomings in LME oversight, the nickel contract remains broken. Volumes and liquidity are sliding leaving the nickel industry without a global reference price with far-reaching consequences. This is nickel, too. This isn't some fringe metal here. A major component of stainless steel, nickel is also a key material for the electric vehicle industry, where it is used in the cathode component of batteries. Declining liquidity, together with low stocks, has led to high LME nickel prices this year, pushing up costs for industrial users already grappling with surging inflation. Global trade in metals is typically priced on the basis of LME contracts, but the lack of reliable benchmark has led some nickel producers to take advantage by trying to go back to a system used before there was a nickel contract when they imposed prices on consumers. The Shanghai Futures Exchange offers nickel futures, but because the Chinese government only allows domestic companies to trade it, the contract cannot be used as a global benchmark. Sounds like if they had let other people use it, they might have gotten the business. They might have started to determine the nickel price. And finally, Deutsche Bank seeks to rejoin Key Gold Trading Club in London. So Deutsche Bank has applied to rejoin the London Bullion Market Association, the world's foremost standard setter for gold trading, as the German lender seeks to expand its trading unit. So just another interesting development here. The LBMA application, quote, brings us into line with other banks that are offering precious metal services. And quote, Deutsche Bank said in a statement, it reflects the careful growth of our precious metals business in recent years and growing client demand for our services. Continuing on, and this is just a headline from CNBC Pro, Goldman and Bank of America see copper soaring to record highs. And another story here, this is Reuters via mining.com. Japan and Congo agree to cooperate on stable supply of rare metals. And let's just take a closer look. Remember, we had a show on ESG in the Congo here and how really the Congo wasn't that bad as a lot of people make it out to be. Ministers from Japan and the DRC agreed on Friday to cooperate on efforts to ensure stable procurement of rare metals in whose supply the African nation occupies a dominant role. Japanese industry minister Yasutoshi Nishimura met the mines minister of DRC Antoinette Nsamba Kalambayi, who was visiting Tokyo for a roundtable meeting on rare metals that involved roughly two dozen companies. They agreed their nations would aim for a, quote, sustainable, mutually beneficial, end quote, relationship involving the mining industry, the government said in a statement. So interesting developments there between J Japan and the Congo. Really got the sense that the global chessboard is being reshuffled here, to mix metaphors. Britain approves first new coal mine in decades despite climate targets. So as the EU is clamping down, Britain is opening a coal mine. This is Reuters via mining.com. And just a quick look here, Britain approved its first new deep coal mine in decades on Wednesday to produce the highly polluting fuel for use in steelmaking, a decision which grew criticism from opponents who say it will hinder climate targets. The Woodhouse Colliery, to be developed by West Cumbria Mining in northwest England, seeks to extract coking coal which is used in the steel industry rather than for electricity generation, it is expected to create around 500 jobs. And a spokesman for the Department of Leveling Up Housing and Communities 
said, quote, this coal will be used for the production of steel and would otherwise need to be imported. It will not be used for power generation. The mine seeks to be net zero in its operations. Well, that'd be something for a coal mine, wouldn't it? And is expected to contribute to local employment and the wider economy. And we are nearing the end here. Russian coal exports come roaring back after EU loosens curb. Bloomberg News via mining.com. Russia's seaborne coal exports returned to near the highest levels on record after the EU loosened restrictions on transporting the commodity, making it easier to redirect volumes to Asia. Shipments in October were almost 16.6 million tons, just shy of the level in June, which is the highest since 2017. Figures from analytics firm Kipler show... Exports have slipped a bit since then, in line with normal seasonal volatility. The EU banned the import of Russian coal and other goods into the bloc as of August 10th. In September, the European Commission issued revised guidance saying that providing services like shipping, financing, and insurance needed to transfer the coal and other products outside the EU should be permitted in order to fight energy and food insecurity worldwide. So it seems like their, you know, rules, their ban really probably crashed face first into reality here of, you know, energy and food insecurity worldwide. And so they had to revise their ban. A few more headlines here. VW says South Africa must end coal dependence for EVs to make sense. This is Reuters via mining.com. South Africa must wean itself off coal if locally produced electric vehicles, a key element of the government's decarbonization plan, are to be climate friendly the country head of Volkswagen said on Wednesday, and we have a quote from Martina Bean, Volkswagen South Africa's managing director, and she told Reuters, quote, the fundamental thing is that finally the source of power can't be coal in the long term for us to make EVs, a thing which is not only a mission-free vehicle, but also helps to save the climate. Right. So if you're making cars that are emission-free with coal, you may be defeating what you're trying to do. And we have another very similar story. Volvo urges Australia to enact new heavy-duty electric truck law. So Volvo wants Australia to mandate electric trucks. And they have a big picture of semi-trailer here. Volvo Group Australia urged the government to progress law changes that would allow it to sell heavy-duty electric trucks to transport and distribution companies. And we have a quote from Volvo Australia CEO Martin Merrick, who told Sky News Australia, quote, into next year, as we want to introduce heavy-duty battery electric vehicles, we need legislation change. What I'm hearing from the National Heavy Vehicle Regulator is a real desire for government to get together to accelerate this legislation change. They know what is required for us to increase the adoption rate, and from what I've heard, there's a real desire to do that. So I guess electric trucks are not quite legal in Australia. And final stories here from foreign policy. NIMBYism is a strategic threat. So not in my backyardism is a strategic threat. Western countries' reluctance to allow rare earth mining at home is cementing dependence on China. So this is Elizabeth Bra, a columnist at Foreign Policy. Let's just read a couple of paragraphs here. The world needs so-called rare earth minerals to power its increasingly digital societies. Almost all rare earth processing, alas, is done in China, which has Western leaders fearing that their country's digital futures, not to mention their green transformations, could be sabotaged by Beijing. But rare earth minerals are not rare at all. They exist in the earth right in our backyards. Now Western mining companies are advancing technology which would allow them to better extract the crucial minerals from mines in their own mountains, and most promisingly, from waste in existing mines. It's relatively clean and unintrusive, though not as clean and unintrusive as having the extraction and processing done by Chinese firms in China and Africa. The German government is in a bind. It wants to reduce Germany's dependence on Chinese processed rare earth minerals while keeping Germany as green as possible. Considering that the 17 elements that make up the rare earth mineral groups are needed in virtually every aspect of modern life, ranging from smartphones and electric car engines to wind turbines and fighter jets, the continued supply is crucial. It's an apt reflection of the world that the green transformation, the West's increasing need for modern arms and, and consumers' increasingly digital lifestyles all require ample access to rare earths. So basically something we've already known, which is the West tends to outsource rare earth mining and the dirty mining to places like China, and that this, in effect, gives China quite a bit of power over our digital lifestyles, courtesy of foreign policy there. And she points out, just finally here, that what happened to Japan in 2010 when China threatened to cut off rare earth mineral exports could happen to the West. And she is basically saying, as many people have pointed out, that this is a strategic threat. 
We've gone around the world once again this quarter, my friends, in preparation for next week's in-depth discussion with Paul from the Sirius Report in order to give you the best information we possibly can on what is actually happening out there. I hope you enjoyed it. If you want to help out the podcast, leave us a review in the Apple Podcast directory. And until next week, take care.